Welcome to 3ABN Worship Hour. My name is John Dinsey, and it is a privilege and an honor to be with you for this hour of study of God's Word, a message from God's book, the book that is life for God's people, a, a book that is beyond all books that could possibly ever be written upon this world. And I praise the Lord for the Holy Scriptures that God has preserved so that it could be a light to our path. And in it, we find wonderful words of life. And I hope that you have read through the Bible and continue to study God's Word because they lead you to Jesus. And praise the Lord for that. Before we begin today, we are going to go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, I encourage you to pray for me and pray for all those that will be joining us in whatever means they choose to study God's Word together. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We come before you in Jesus' name. And Heavenly Father, I place myself in your hands and I pray for your blessing of your Holy Spirit that the words that proceed out of my mouth may come from your throne of grace. We ask, Lord, that every word will bring you honor and glory. And we pray that your name will be praised, and we pray that you will give us light for our lives. We ask you in the holy and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The title for this message is Death's Painful Sting and the Joyful Resurrection. During the past several months, we have seen some wonderful friends, brothers and sisters from the church, and even family go down to the grave. They, they died. It has been a painful experience. But I heard at some funerals some things that was of concern to me because uh, there's no support for this in the Bible. So today we're going to talk about death's painful sting and the joyful resurrection. Given the fact that death is a part of life in this, in this world, some people say that the moment that you're born is when you begin to die. But the Bible says that God promises to his children eternal life. And the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, death was never meant to be a part of of the experience of human beings. This came as a result of sin. And this is why you find in the Bible, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. But please understand that because of sin coming into this world, we all can experience and may experience what the Bible calls the first death or the death that comes as a result of sickness, someone killing you, an accident, or even, even weakness from old age, you can die in this world as a result of one of those things. And if the Lord tarries, if Jesus tarries and doesn't come during uh, the next, let's say, 50 or 60 years, the majority of you that are listening to me may go down to the grave. So what happens when you go down to the grave? What is going on? So let's look into the Bible to see what the Bible tells us. I like to look in Luke, uh, I'm sorry, John chapter 11. John chapter 11, and there we have a wonderful story. And it talks to us about Jesus and how he sympathizes with us. There in John chapter 11, we're going to begin in Verse 1. Notice, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. That was the message from Mary and Martha. 
they were concerned because it didn't appear to be just a common cold. It appeared to be something that threatened the life of their beloved brother, Lazarus. So they sent this message to Jesus, him whom you love, they could have just said, hey, uh, master, Lazarus is sick. But they, they, they said these words to awaken in him the love that he already had for him. Him whom you love is sick. In other words, come as quick as you can. But notice what happens as we continue reading. Uh, in there, in verse 4, it says, When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Again, I want to bring out to you that uh, sin is a part of uh, the existence of the human race because sin entered into the world. Now, I mentioned that there is a first death and a second death. The second death is the death that those who refuse to accept salvation and live a wicked life will receive at the end of the thousand years described in Revelation chapter 20. But here we have Lazarus that died. And Jesus, it says in verse 5, uh, 5 and 6, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And Martha and Mary waited anxiously for Jesus to return. And Jesus did not return during the time they were hoping he would return. Their hope was that Jesus would drop whatever he's doing and head to Bethany. Head to Bethany to heal Lazarus. They knew he had the power to heal. And so Jesus stayed two days, and during that time, Lazarus died. Now let's go back to the scriptures and see what Jesus says. In verse 7 of John chapter 11, Then after this he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Again, Jesus ministered where he was. He healed the sick. He preached. But after two days had passed, he said, Let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now notice what Jesus says in John chapter 11 and verse um, 11. These things he said, and after he said to them, our friend, Lazarus, sleeps. But I go that I may wake him up. And it's very interesting what Jesus said. And to the disciples, uh, this was a good thing. Notice what they say. Verse 12, then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. He will rest and get well. That's what they were thinking. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Verse 14, then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, I find this very interesting, and it is not new in the Bible. It is found throughout the Old Testament that when people died, uh, there are many instances when the Bible will say, so-and-so died, and so-and-so -and -so slept with his fathers and was buried. Many, many scriptures that say that. In fact, there are about 40 instances in the Bible where when someone dies, it says that they sleep or, and are buried or are resting in the grave. Now, the disciples thought he was just having the, the sleep that most of us need. <laughs> Every night, we, we are tired. We have to head to that bed to rest for several hours 
and then wake up the next day to resume life's activities. But this is not what Lazarus was doing. He had died. And Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then he said, verse 15, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Jesus was glad that he was not there because he would heal him from the sickness. But Jesus allowed this to happen because there was something very important that had to take place. People had to see this great miracle that they may believe, as he said to his disciples. And then it says, verse, last part of verse 15, nevertheless, let us go to him. So there you have the, the uh, description uh, of what happened. And Jesus starts heading that way. And now I uh, ask you to join me in verse 17. Notice, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined uh, the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. So Jesus did not go directly to the house. Martha heard that Jesus was there and went there quickly to tell him of the news that she thought Jesus did not know. Uh, now let us continue reading. And verse 21, Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, in tears and sorrow, she says, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. Martha believed that Jesus could heal the sick. It is evident by her words. Now notice what Jesus says to her. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, wonderful words, your brother will rise again. Praise the Lord. He gave her this wonderful message. Your brother will rise again. But she did not understand him. Notice what she said in verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Very interesting what Martha has just said. I know that he will rise again at the last day. This is marvelous. She understood that Lazarus was dead and in the grave. Most people do not understand that. They think when, if the righteous die, when they die, they go immediately to heaven. If the wicked die, they go immediately to hell. This is what most people believe. But Martha did not believe this. She believed what Jesus had already said in the past. And we were going we're gonna to go through that in the scriptures. She said, I know that he will rise again. When did she say? At the last day. Notice that Martha did not say uh, that he already went to heaven. Notice now what Jesus says to her. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And notice verse 26. And whoever lives and believes in me, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is to come into the world. Now, notice that Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Notice that Jesus did not take the time to say, Martha, I know you're sorrowful. I know this is a painful experience, but you know that he is in a better place. This is what we hear today when someone passes away and somebody wants to comfort someone who is suffering because they lost their loved one. He or she is in a better place. You, he, he or she is in heaven enjoying the wonderful joys of heaven. This is what people say today, but this is not what the Bible says here. Jesus did not comfort her by saying, don't worry. Lazarus is happy right now. He's with my father in heaven. He is with the angels. He is enjoying all the joys of heaven. You see, Jesus said that Lazarus was asleep because that's where he was. Now, I want to point to you that 
Martha understood that resur the resurrection takes place at the last day. Now let's go into this uh, scripture that is found in John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, we're going to keep our finger there in John uh, chapter 11 because we're going to come back to that. In John chapter 6, <clears throat> we are going to the scriptures found in verses 39 and 40. John chapter 6, verse 39 and 40. Notice, this, this is Jesus, Jesus speaking. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Martha knew this. Jesus had already taught this. She had learned this from Jesus. This is why she says that Lazarus will rise again at the last day. And Jesus said at the last day. Now let's continue in verse 40. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Well, when is the last day? The last day is when Jesus returns at the second coming. And we're going to see that in the scriptures. So Martha understood this. That the last day, the time of the resurrection of Lazarus, was not the day that he died. was the day when Jesus would come again. Now, let's go to uh, John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, to continue studying this. Jesus says, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming, notice, coming, in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Jesus did not say, when people die, they immediately go to heaven or they immediately go to hell. Notice what he says. Verse 29, and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Two resurrections are mentioned by Jesus. Remember that we just read there's the resurrection of life, that is eternal life, and the resurrection of condemnation in which the wicked will suffer for their sins and eventually die. This is why I also said John 3.16. What does John 3.16 say again? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall have what? Everlasting life. Notice Notice that it is those who believe that have everlasting life. Those who do not believe do not have or get everlasting life. The verse continues or ends this way. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. In other words, those that do not believe will perish. Those that believe have everlasting life. This is plainly, plainly uh, you can plainly see that in John chapter 3 verse 16. Notice that Jesus says the hour is coming in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, uh, indicating that there's a specific time. Because, see, all the righteous are resurrected at the same time. All the wicked are resurrected, resurrected together at the same time, when their time comes. And the resurrection of the righteous occurs at the coming of Jesus. The resurrection of damnation occurs at the after the thousand years, and you can see this in Revelation chapter 20. Please read Revelation chapter 20. We may not have time during this, this time that we are together. So you see, it is not when you die that you are resurrected to the resurrection of life or the resurrection of condemnation, if that is what you deserve. It is when the specific time comes for you, whether you're righteous or whether you are wicked. Notice what it says in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, that uh, also helps us to understand uh, this very teaching. It's in, it's in the Bible, in the Old and the New Testament. Daniel chapter 12, and we're going to read verse 1 and 2. Notice, at that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even 
to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And that is what the Bible says. Notice verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That is, they will be resurrected. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So we see here that the resurrection uh, of the righteous is spoken of in the Old Testament as well. Now notice this message in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 30 and 31, that helps us understand when the resurrection of the righteous occurs. Notice Matthew 24, 30 and 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 31. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to the other. So you see, this is when the resurrection of the righteous takes place. He's gathering together the elect when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Now, we read John chapter 11, where Jesus says concerning Lazarus that he was asleep. And then he clarified by saying that he is dead. Let's go into Psalm 30, 13 and verse 3. Psalm 13 and verse 3, David is saying, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Also, I point you to Acts chapter 7, verse 59 and 60. This is found in the New Testament as well. We already read John chapter 11, where Jesus said that death is as asleep. John chapter 7, verse 59 and 60, this is Stephen. And Stephen is there in front of the scribes and Pharisees, the leaders of Israel. And uh, they were not happy with what Stephen was saying. And in verse 59, the Bible says, And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he has said this, he fell asleep. This is not talking about taking a rest. This is talking that they killed him with the stones they were throwing to him. I'm going to mention several scriptures right now. I'm not looking them up, but I'm mentioning them to tell you that these are verses of uh, over 30, uh, uh, over 40, that speak of death as a sleep. In 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 35, I'll read that one. And Jehu slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And Jehoahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. I'll read another one, 2 Kings 13, 9. And Jehoahaz, Jehoahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And Joash, his son, reigned in his, in his stead. In 2 Kings... 15.7, it says, So Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers. And uh, let me go to Solomon. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 31. And Solomon slept with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David, his father. And Re Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. There are many scriptures that speak this way. And where are people buried today? They are buried in what? Cemeteries. Do you know the etymology of the word cemetery? The etymology of the word, that means the origin of the word, where it comes from. Cemetery, a, a definition of cemetery is an area set apart for or containing graves, tombs, or a funeral urns, especially one that is not churchyard, burial ground, or graveyard. That's a cemetery. But the etymology of the word is comes from the um, Greek word koimiterion, koimiterion, and in Greek that is a sleeping place, equivalent to koimi, which means to put to sleep, it's a sleeping place. The word cemetery that we have today comes from the Greek word, which means a sleeping place. 
And this is what the grave is, a sleeping place. In Acts chapter 2, verse 29, and I'm going to read to, to you till verse 35, just for clarity of what's going on. This is Peter talking. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this which you now see and hear. Now listen to verse 34. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says of himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. I read to you from Acts chapter 2 all the way from verse 29 to verse 34. And this is what the Bible says concerning David. David has not ascended to heaven. His grave is still with us. In other words, he is still there buried. He has not ascended to heaven. And we believe and understand that David was a righteous person. And he is there in the, uh, in, in the Bible as a testimony of the righteous. So you see, David had not ascended to heaven. He was still buried, waiting the resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous. You see, it is because the resurrection of all the righteous occurs together at a specific time by Jesus at the last day. And the Bible states that this is as his coming. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. This is referring Jesus, that by Jesus, the man, the son of man, came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam... All die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Notice that it says, shall be made alive. Notice verse 23, but each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. So here again we see that there's a scripture that clearly tells us when the righteous are going to be resurrected. Those that are Christ are going to be resurrected at His coming. They are not in heaven enjoying the bliss of heaven, the wonderful things of heaven right now. And unfortunately, I am going to tell you the, the way I feel it. Unfortunately, I believe that this idea that the righteous go to heaven immediately when they die has brought a lot of pain to people. Why? Because many a children have been told, your father, your mother is in heaven right now. God needed them and they are in heaven. And these children do not get a good picture of God because they think, God took my father. God took my mother. But the Bible does not say that when you die, you go to heaven. The Bible says that when you die, you are resting asleep, waiting for the resurrection of the righteous. That is, if you are righteous. And many a people have turned away from God knowing, oh, my brother killed somebody and never repented. My brother is right now in hell burning and my brother lived only 40 years old, and he will be burning forever and ever and ever. You see, unfortunately, this idea, this doctrine that when you die, you go immediately to hell if you were wicked, has done so much harm to 
to God's character. Because you see, God is just, fair, and good. He will not allow anyone to suffer any more than they deserve. If you deserve punishment for killing one, you will suffer punishment for killing one. And then you will die. You see, it says the, the, uh, the wicked servant is worthy. The wicked servant that is worthy of many stripes will receive many stripes, the Bible says. But if you're worthy of few stripes, few, less punishment, you will receive less punishment. So you see, the idea, let me, let me put it in, 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 in context for you. We look at the Bible and we see that Cain killed Abel. We have no record of Cain killing anyone else. Let us say for the sake of discussion that Cain only killed one person. Yet we have other people. There's John Wayne Gacy. There is a Hitler. There are many others. Uh, there, are, there are people in different countries, dictators, that are responsible. There's a dictator from my country, uh, Trujillo. He is responsible, they say, for killing many people. And so these individuals, and you compare them to Cain, killed one person, and yet the idea that when Cain died, he went immediately to hell. He has been suffering, according to the, the, that idea, that he's been suffering from the day he died all the way for uh, about 6,000 years already for killing one person. This does not paint a just and true picture of God. Because God will not punish one person, no person, any more than they deserve. And it is sad to think that some people paint God in that picture when we have here in this earth people or, or judges or, or prisons that after somebody has done whatever wicked crime they have done and they say, you're going to serve life in prison. But then that person in prison behaves well. 10 years pass, maybe 15, who knows, maybe 20, and they say, you have served your, your sentence. You have, you have uh, reformed. We're going to set you free. And you see, uh, you're making people more righteous, more merciful than God. God is just and fair and good, and he will not allow anyone to suffer more than they deserve. And that's why you hear in the Bible that God says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And that's the way the Bible is. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, an arm for an arm. The wicked will suffer according to the evil deeds they have done. So let us go now that uh, to understand this, let us go to see uh, some people, because uh, we, we have to see what the scripture says concerning, because there are some people that were resurrected, and the Bible specifies this. The Bible specifies this. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. What I'm trying to say to you is that those people that are identified in the Bible as having the opportunity or privilege to be, to be taken to heaven, the Bible specifies that. Because the Bible identifies there's a resurrection of the righteous when Christ returns, and there's a resurrection of the wicked after the thousand years. Again, read that in Revelation chapter 20. And notice now, so Enoch is mentioned by name. In Jude chapter 1 verse 9, it says, Yet Michael the archangel... In contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dare not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Michael the archangel went to resurrect Moses from the dead, and it appears that Satan was not happy about this. Perhaps he was unhappy because the time had not come. Because the devil knows when this happens. It's at the last day when Jesus returns. And here is Michael the archangel, which is actually Jesus, and we don't have time to enter into that. He came to resurrect uh, Moses. And just as he said, he heard his voice, the voice of Jesus, and he was resurrected, mentioned by name. This is why at the Mount of Transfiguration, you have two individuals that appear to Jesus, Moses and Elijah specified by the Bible as going to heaven. Look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. 
Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, specifically mentioned in the Bible that Elijah went to heaven. So the Bible clearly mentions these special opportunities, these moments, uh, special moments when certain individuals were resurrected, taken to heaven for a reason that God reserves unto himself. But the rest of the dead, whether righteous or wicked, are resting in the grave, except for a group of people that we are now going to read about. Let's go to the Bible for that. I'm going now to Matthew chapter 27. And in Matthew chapter 27, a group of people are identified. And notice what the Bible says concerning these people. Matthew chapter 27, and I'm going to verses uh, 50 and 51. It says in verse 50, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Verse 52, And the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints who have fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So this is a, 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 a select group of people that were resurrected to bear testimony of the resurrection of Christ. And they appeared to many. So these individuals, we don't know who they are, are specifically identified in the Bible as being resurrected before the time of what we can call the general resurrection of the righteous. Now, it is interesting to note that it says that these people came out of the graves. It doesn't say they came down from heaven. These saints did not come down from heaven. The Lord raised them up from the grave. So please understand that this is how it is going to be for the righteous at the coming of Jesus. Now notice these scriptures because we have to make this clear because some people say when you die, you go to heaven and you're praising the Lord and you're enjoying the bliss of heaven. In Psalm 115, verse 17, the Bible says very clear words, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. Very clear. Psalm uh, chapter 6, or Psalm 6, verse 4 and 5. Return, O Lord, deliver me. O save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave who will give you thanks? David the psalmist understood that if he dies, he cannot praise the Lord. Why? Because he is resting in the grave, unable to praise the Lord because his voice is silenced. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 18 and 19 says, For Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit, that is the grave, cannot hope for your truth. They cannot hope because they cease to exist. They are asleep, resting in the grave. Notice what it says in verse 19, Isaiah 38, 19. The living, the living man, he shall praise you as I do this day. The Father shall make known your truth to the children. So it is the living that can praise the Lord. Those that die cannot praise the Lord until they are resurrected. So they are not in heaven praising God. They're not in heaven singing in a choir. And some children have been told God needed, the father needed another voice in his choir. So he called your father. He called your brother. He called your little sister. And painful sorrow and I would say to you even hatred toward God has appeared in the heart of children and Mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters thinking God took my relative to heaven. So I say to you, this idea has painted God as a, a dictator, someone who, who punishes people, 
unjustly for thousands and thousands of years and throughout eternity for a short life of maybe 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 100 years, and they're being punished throughout eternity? God is not like that. The wages of sin is death. People will be judged according to their works, and then the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So why do the majority of the Christian denominations believe that the righteous go to heaven when they die? Some people point to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And this is, go we're going to go now to John chapter, uh, no, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Now, I like to say to you that this is a parable. This is a what? A parable. And in John, um, Luke chapter 15 and 16, Jesus tells several parables. There's the parable of the lost coin. There's the parable of uh, the lost sheep. There's the parable of the prodigal son. And these are parables. There's also the parable of, of salt uh, here. And the parable of the unjust steward in Luke chapter 16. So this parable of the rich man and Lazarus, we have to consider it according to the understanding that it is a parable. And what is a parable? If you go to a dictionary, this is what you will find. I am reading to you from the Merriam-Webster dictionary that tells us what the definition of a parable. A parable, a usually short, fictitious story that illustrates a moral attitude or a religious principle. So Jesus told this parable to bring a moral understanding or a religious principle, and we're going to look into that as time permits. Let's read the parable, beginning in verse, um, Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate. And notice, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. There's a great gulf fix in this story. Now, please understand that the popular belief in those days was, if you're rich, you are blessed by God, and you are going to heaven. That's what the common people believed. And if you're not rich, well, you're a wicked person. And so when Jesus, Jesus turns the tables around to them and puts this rich person in Hades. Now, please understand, again, that this is a parable. You cannot take the details out of this parables and form a doctrine out of it. Scholars do not look at parables as things that you can form doctrines from. Scholars do not do this. They, they, they know it's a, a story. They know it's a, a, a fictitious story that you cannot take the details and say, this is a doctrine that we can form from here. And please understand, we have already discussed that what happens when you die. When you die, if you're righteous, you are waiting in the grave until the resurrection of the righteous. If you are evil, if you are wicked, you are waiting in the grave until the resurrection of the wicked. So what is going on here? Let's look at the details. So the purpose of the par parable is to teach a moral lesson, and a doctrine cannot be formulated by it. 
Does the Bible teach parables about things that are not necessarily true? Let's look at one. Um, let's look at one found in Judges chapter 9. Judges chapter 9, and it is there from verse 7 through 16. I do not have time to read all of that. I encourage you to do that. Judges chapter 9, verses 7 through 16. Now notice the details of this parable, this story. Now when they told Jotham, he went and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted his voice and cried out, and he said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went forward to anoint the king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I, cease my, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and go to sway over trees? Then the trees said to the fig tree, you come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over the trees? And the story or parable continues, and this is obviously something fictitious to bring out an important lesson, and you cannot form a doctrine out of this parable. Otherwise, we would have to say that trees can talk, and the trees are going around trying to ask the other trees to be king over them. So we cannot take these details of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus and form doctrines. This is what the Bible says about forming doctrines. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9 and 10. Whom will I teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept and line upon line upon line. Here a little and there a little. So we see here uh, when you go to um, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9 and 10, in the King James Version, it's, it, it, makes the, it brings out the word doctrine there. So here, uh, in order to form a doctrine, you must have scriptures and scriptures and scriptures that lead you to that teaching, that understanding. So this is a parable, a story to bring out an illustration of what Jesus wants to say. So let's look at the parable uh, in detail. Notice in this parable that there is no talk of soul or spirit going to Abraham's bosom or going to Hades. And the idea that people form is, or they say, well, your soul goes to heaven and your body stays in the grave. There is no talk of this. this is, you have literal physical individuals described in the story. This is why they talk about fingers being dipped in, in cool water and uh, the other details as we have already read. Now notice there in Luke chapter 16, verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue where I'm tormented in this flame. In this verse, we see something to be concerned about. If this was a literal, then... Uh, if this is literal, then we have to get the idea that uh, a little drop of water can cool somebody's tongue and uh, give them relief. And so that's a detail that we have to say this is a parable, this is a story. And it, it, it says that the person has a finger. The idea of a soul is, is just a, a, a spirit that is flying around and, and can go through walls and things of this nature. So in this verse, we also see that there is a great gulf between the righteous and the wicked, or the earth and heaven. And apparently, according to the story, they can talk one to another. Is this true? Can that, can that be? No, this is not true because when the, the, the righteous are resurrected at the general resurrection when Jesus comes and the wicked are laying in the grave until their appointed time comes to be resurrected from there. They're not right now in hell suffering in torments of hell. And there are people that have dreamed things. They dream they have gone to hell and seen things and described things. And this is obviously, they have, they have been uh, 
hearing this throughout their life and they're having a dream according to what they have taught. I have had dreams that I thought, boy, this is real. This is real. I had dreamed of the second coming. I saw the bright lights and it seemed so real to me that I could tell you I, I've experienced the second coming and I could give you details about it. And so when we hear things from people that went to heaven or, or, or went to hell, we have to compare with what the Bible says. What does the Bible says? So if this is a literal description of what happens, how can the righteous enjoy heaven if they can see and hear their friends and family down there being tormented in hell? How can they enjoy? Because you see, not all fathers will have their children in heaven. Not all children will have their father in heaven. You may have a separation, a father whose wife did not make it to heaven, and is she in hell or if vice versa? It could be the wife in heaven and the husband in hell, and they could hear them screaming. They love them. They love and can't do anything to save them. That's torment for those that would be in heaven. They would be suffering. How can you possibly enjoy heaven knowing that your relative, your loved one, is in hell suffering and suffering, suffering without any rest whatsoever? Now, there are explanations for these things. There are verses that speak of tormented day and night forever and ever. We have to look at the context. We have to look at what the Bible says, compare Scripture with Scripture, and understand that the wages of sin is death. The wicked eventually have to die because that, the Bible, is true. So, uh, the great gulf, and they cannot pass between one and another. In this story, you have to ask yourself the question as well. Do all the righteous go to Abraham's bosom? I mean, how many righteous people die every day? He would get very crowded very quickly because there could be a thousand people that righteous, good, wonderful people that die today. If they were really, according to the idea that you go to heaven, all these people are going to Abraham's bosom. It's just these details, you cannot take them to form a doctrine. And so let's look at Revelation chapter uh, 22. Uh, actually, let me finish with the message of the parable first. Let's go to uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 27. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, this is Lazarus talking to Abraham in the story. Uh, then he said, I beg you, therefore, father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And verse 31, but he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And you see, Jesus here is talking in this parable the scribes and Pharisees are there. The leaders, the priests, they're there. They're listening to the parable. And the message that Jesus said to them, that even if one was to be resurrected from the dead, you will not believe. You do not believe Moses. You do not believe the prophets. And even if one is resurrected from the dead, you will not believe. Lazarus, that we have already talked about, the brother of Mary and Martha, Jesus resurrected him from the dead, and still the Jews, the scribes, the Pharisees, did not believe. In fact, the Bible says they were trying to kill Lazarus and Jesus. So this is what the parable brings out. This is what Jesus was trying to say. This is the message of the parable of Lazarus, the beggar, and the rich man. You see, they believed, they believed that the, 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 the rich people, they're going to heaven. But Jesus turned the tables around, and it is those that serve the Lord with all their heart and that accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they will go to heaven. So the question is, will you believe the words 
of Jesus. Will you take him at his word? Remember, this is what Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 39 and 40. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Read all of John chapter 6. Jesus repeats this message. I will raise him up at the last day four times at the last day. Not when they die, at the last day when Jesus returns. And the idea that the soul is immortal, there's not one scripture in all the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that says that the soul is immortal. In Ezekiel chapter 18, it says, the soul that's in it, it shall die. Notice in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14 through 16, that you keep this commandment without spot blameless until our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ appearing, which he will make manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in inapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Only God has immortality. Only God has immortality. Those that love the Lord, the righteous, if they die, or if you're alive when Jesus comes, that's when you receive immortality. Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, beginning in verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal, that's what we are, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Believe in the words of Jesus. The righteous will be resurrected when Jesus returns. No time before. God bless you.